last Monday night, uh, there's a fellow in Portsmouth uh -huh. named Max uh, Ross. And he does a lot of sound at Willersburg. He mm -hmm. runs the sound up there at that cinema. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's, he's got a little studio there in his apartment. He's got one room. And I'll tell you, I was impressed with his setup. Very impressed. And he's dirt cheap. And maybe you can get another CD of Yeah, I, 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 guess, uh, I guess it'll be a group CD. And it's kind of unique how we did it, you know, how they can dub the heart and how they can dub stuff in there. So we had some good harmony and plus on two of the songs, I've done some bass on it. Wow. I said, like, that's cool, you know. I said, but I had to share that with you. I that said, it's is been a blessing. Good, that's it, wonderful. It's been a, it's been a busy week. <laughs> but praise the Lord, we're still above ground. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Please turn to your Kindle fire. I wish I had one. <laughs> Document 121. Romans chapter 8. We began this morning with our study in the book of Romans. They that are of the flesh, verse 5, do mind the things of the flesh. <coughs> well, in verse 4 of Romans chapter 8, he began, begins a new section of thought and goes to verse 5. Verse 5 to the end of the chapter. And the main object that Paul is to prove, Romans 8, 1 through 1, there is therefore now no condemnation. And from verse 5 throughout the rest of the chapter, Paul's point is this. I'm going to prove to you, give you some propositions that are going to prove that statement is correct. Herein is the fundamental intention. Paul's purpose is to show the absolute certainty and the finality of the full and complete salvation of all those who are in Christ. That is, of all who are in the dominion of the Spirit mm -hmm. and in whom the Holy Spirit of God dwells. Mm -hmm. Of course, the salvation sets forth only applies to such people as have been set free from the law of sin and death by the law of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. They are the only people whom there is no condemnation and the conviction of guilt. Of course, as we have seen, Paul has been reminding us in verses 3 and 4, of the way in which believers have been put into that position and thereby set free from the law and its demands and all that it does who are not saved are still in the flesh. And Paul is going to prove that it is essential to go to heaven is that we should be in Christ and in the reality of the Spirit before this can even be possible for us. And Paul shows us in verses 3 and 4 how we get in verses 1 and 2. Then Paul proceeds with facts to establish that it is only such people that is full and complete and has final salvation is really guaranteed and is absolutely certain. Verse 4 says that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. So then in Romans 8 verses 5 through verse 13 
is to prove that argument in verse 4. What Paul has told us then in verse 4, the object of our salvation in the first place is righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, and the righteousness of the law is fulfilled in those who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now let me give you an overview of, the first, of chapter 5 through verse 13. In verses 5 through verse 8, Paul is giving us a picture of the difference between a Christian and a non-Christian. And the only way the law can be fulfilled in the Christian is in verses 5 through 8. Then when we get to verse 9 through verse 11, Paul applies this to the Roman Christians. And Paul shows them that their current position is in the light of the fact, as well as their future glory is going to be an outcome. Then when we get to verses 12 and 13, Paul gives the Roman Christians a practical exhortation because of all that is true of them. If I'm going, if I am reading verse 1 through 4 correctly, Paul is talking about all Christians, not just some Christians. He is not talking about those spiritual Christians versus carnal Christians but all Christians. Every Christian has been free from the guilt of sin and death. There are no Christians who has not been free from the law of sin and death, no matter how your spiritual condition may be at the present time. You may be a spiritually depressed Christian. You may be a running out down Christian. You may be a Christian that's running on low fuel. You may be a Christian running on bad food. I don't know. You may have a lot of upset thinking in your mind. But let me share with you, all Christians are in the same boat. Thank goodness for that. There is another yeah. principle that we see in verses 5 through verse 13. What happens, there is, there is a complete change in us is absolutely essential for salvation. If a person does not experience a radical change, if he does not enter into the dominion of the Spirit, the righteousness of the law cannot be fulfilled in him. Christianity is this, a radical change in the nature of this human being. A radical change of man's nature, Charles Spurgeon. It is a particular feature in our holy religion that is began, it begins its work within and acts first upon our hearts. Other religions, like that of the Pharisees, begin with an outward form of ceremonies perhaps hoping to work inwardly from without. Although the process never ends so, for the outside of the cup and of the platter is made clean, but the inside still remains full of rottenness before them. No truth, Spurgeon said, is more sure than the concerning all the sons of men. Ye must be born again. Amen. Yeah, right. God is, in other words, there must be an entire radical change of man's nature. The gospel does not flinch from this, but enforces this declaration. When uh -huh. the gospel hits the sinner, there is going to be a radical change in that believer, that lost person. The Holy Spirit does not attempt to improve human nature into something better, but lays the axe at the root of the tree and declares that we must become new creatures in Christ 
and that by a supernatural work of the omnipotent God, we become a different person. In all Christians, in all Christians, not just some Christians, there will be a radical change. Well, he's a Christian, but he hasn't been changed yet. There is no such thing as a Christian that has not been changed, or he hasn't been right. changed yet. Right. You might want to call some Christians carnal. But I remind you that Paul is going to make it clear that they are not Christians at all. You are a Christian that may act Differently, but there's been a radical change. Listen carefully to this. To say there is no condemnation, to say there is, to say that the person has been delivered from the law of sin and death, and is changed, and is now in the new dominion, and his hope is certain, and there is nothing that ever will rob him of that. Well, okay. How are we going to consider this thing that is before us? Well, first, let's consider what Paul tells us about the non-Christian. And then after this, to look at the Christian positive. Generally, have you noticed that people don't like to hear a description of one who is not a Christian. The Puritans preached, I, I picked up a book, and I saw it again this week, The Almost Christian. The title of this Puritan book, he preached 12 sermons on the almost Christian. As I was going through all of those, most people who are in this condition believe they are Christians. They would rather feel they are Christians without any, any description as to what a Christian really is. Just tell me I'm a Christian. Don't describe to me what a Christian is. Just tell me I'm a Christian. When you start describing what the Bible says a Christian really is, they become very defensive. But Paul describes a non-Christian as a person who is after the flesh. What does that mean? Well, we have seen some of what that means over the last several weeks, haven't we? We have seen that the flesh is a description of a person's nature what is what he really is the flesh is described as a person who has a fallen sinful bent in his life he is a person who is left to himself to grow and to develop in life in his world without any influence of God in his life he lives in his own world does his own thing and God has no influence or impact on what he does. The term that we've seen after the flesh or maybe best to say under the flesh. He is under the power of the flesh. Now the idea carries the idea of it under something else. 